Hello, hello. How is everyone doing today? Sabrina Victoria here. So I am working on a Facebook Live, a YouTube video, and a podcast all at once. For those of you that follow me, you know that I just broke my leg and it literally, I almost fell over like five separate times trying to set all this up with all the tripods and the desk and everything else. I kept just like tripping over all of the things. So I'm a little woo, full of anxiety at the moment just because um, I'm finally walking in like regular shoes after literally snapping my leg in half back in October. And um, I had a little bit of a scare there, but I'm good. <laughs> so um, today I am talking about tips for recovering from narcissist or narcissism or um, being in a narcissistic relationship, I should say. Uh, the last few uh, episodes that I have done have been on the characteristics of narcissism. And I know that there are so many other brilliantly spoken uh, mentors out there regarding narcissism and what it means and what it is and the definitions and all of that stuff. And I don't like to, in my life just in general, I don't like to sit and dwell on the problem. I like to focus more on the solutions. So I know I've been kind of leading up to some things and um, I just kind of want to jump right in and I want to get down dirty, nitty gritty to how to recover, how to get over it. Um, I was in a narcissistic uh, abusive relationship for... The last one was 13 years long, plus two because I worked with him, so actually 15 years. And then before that, I had a slew of relationships that had incredible narcissistic traits, including friendships. Um, I didn't know about narcissism until probably eight years ago. And when I found out, I was dead set in the middle of this horrible um, relationship, had no idea what it was, literally thought everything was my fault, my problem, my issue. I'm too overly sensitive. I'm too emotional. I'm such a baby. I'm um, overly dramatic. And come to find out that it actually wasn't me. And I wasn't crazy. And I am not insane. <laughs> so um, it's been a while now uh, since I have completely gone no contact. And I want of the fortunate ones. Um, when I went no contact, he actually totally left me alone. And I think the way that I left, um, I actually had already set him up with another supply. And I know that that sounds bad, but, um, you know, my the last two years I was with him, I was just strictly working for him. I had already moved out. The, re the romantic relationship was already over, but he was still hanging on to me as far as an energy source, like 100%. He'd call me all hours of the night and day, blowing up my phone, constantly harassing me, constantly putting me down, still even in the work environment in front of his work associates. And... um Finally, I just had it and I told him that he had to bring someone else in or, and I was leaving. I said, this is it. I'm leaving. I'm giving you six months and you either bring someone in to replace me or I'm just walking in six months. So you have a choice, but this is it a hundred percent. And he knew I was serious, like a thousand percent. I made it very clear to him that this was the end of all of it. And I had left before, I had threatened before, I had done all the things before. But by this point, you know, 14 years basically, I had done so much research, had gained so much power. I was so confident. I was incredibly well-spoken. He um, couldn't beat me in these arguments that he used to be able to cycle me around into and I'd cry like a baby and I'd be all distraught and lock myself in the bathroom. And I had just gained so much power and self-confidence within myself that he wasn't able to do that anymore. And so when I gave him this ultimatum, he knew. And so he, again, trying to trip me up, decided to bring his then girlfriend, who he had been seeing for only a couple of months, 
in to replace me. So I, of course, didn't care. I hated him. It didn't matter to me, but it was strange. It was weird. Um, you know, their relationship issues started to kind of seep in and he'd tell me little things and she cried a handful of times in front of me because he was triggering her. And she, of course, was similar to me, an empath. We were almost identical. It was so scary. And she uh, had been in narcissistic relationships before this. And I didn't tell her he is a narcissist, but I told her like, he's not a good person. He is, he is not what she thinks he is. Um, but I said to her, I said, listen, I am not here to tell you what to do, what not to do, to leave or not leave. This is all on you. You're a grown woman. She's my same age. And I said, all I'm doing is just warning you to just be careful and keep your boundaries. I kept saying that. And considering the fact that she had already, she already knew about narcissism just like I did, I figured using words like trigger or boundary, she would kind of get the hint, but she didn't. And just like me, he chose somebody who was um, not well off. She was weak mentally, emotionally, uh, financially, incredibly weak. Basically the same girl that I was when I met him way back when. So um, anyways, I trained her. I trained her completely in the business. I stuck by her side, ins and outs of running his personal life and his business. And um, finally, you know, towards the end, I don't even think I made it a full six months, but towards the end, there was so much just crap. The triangulation was going on and he said, she said was going on and she was coming to me with stuff and he was coming to me with stuff and I was getting caught in the middle and I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. So I just I literally wrote an email with my resignation that day and I said, I'm quitting today. That's it. And um, they were both in the office. It was super uncomfortable. I was shaking. I was literally shaking. Uh, she could tell that I was visibly and physically upset and distraught. And I could barely speak. I, you know, this was like my life. I had spent 15 years building a business with this man. And I was walking away that day and I was just handing it over to some other woman. Um, it was a, a huge feat and I walked out tall. I walked out confidently. I never looked back. I didn't, nothing, just cut all ties and it felt really, really, really good. So I kind of want to talk about, I have a few notes here, but I kind of want to talk about the importance of being patient with yourself. It takes a second. It really does. It really honestly takes a second to really calm yourself and realize that you were abused. You know, the, the main thing that happened to me when I left and I started to settle down into my new life and started to settle down into my new world and... Uh, my new home and my my like freedom <laughs> that I wasn't used to and my phone wasn't ringing. There's a trauma bond that happens where you're like addicted to the attention. You're addicted to the noise. You're addicted to the to the chaos and the turmoil. And when it goes cold like that, there is a sense of like um withdrawal almost it's it's like a drug seriously and you really have to be patient with how those feelings are and what they are and and sit in the silence that's what it is that's literally the only thing i can say you have to be okay and learn to sit in the silence because you're so used to so much dopamine basically energy constantly bad energy flowing your way and then all of a sudden there's nothing and you feel almost worthless you feel almost like garbage and you have to realize that one and you have to accept that and find joy in that. 
find joy in that. And that's a tough thing. And I'm telling you that from personal experience, it sounds so crazy, but it's a tough thing for about, I want to say it took me about a month. The other thing that I went through was after it's all said and done, you kind of think you're crazy. You really start to question whether or not you did exaggerate it, whether or not you did make it up. Um, you did, you were overly dramatic or you were overly sensitive. And you have to accept, you have to acknowledge and you have to accept the fact that it was an abusive relationship, you were abused, and it did actually happen to the level that you think it happened, even though it doesn't seem at that moment. And the only way that I can liken it to for females, and I apologize for not having an analogy for the male, but for those of you that are mothers who have given birth vaginally with a child, during childbirth, and up until probably the ninth month, the pain, it's not necessarily a pain, but the discomfort is not fun. And all the way leading up to it, the contractions are not fun. Giving childbirth is not fun. It hurts. You're sweating. You're screaming. You're terrified. You're scared. You're all of the things all at once. And about a month later, you can't really put, you know that it hurts. Like, you know that it was painful. You can visually see it. You remember what you said. Like, I remember I kept saying over over again, it hurts so bad. I just kept screaming, it hurts so bad. It hurts so bad. Um, I remember that, but to actually remember the pain and to describe the pain and to feel the pain and to bring the pain back up, it's hard to. It's hard to figure it out. It's hard to recognize or put into words or a vocabulary sentence of what that pain was, what it felt like, how it made you feel. It gets more and more difficult as time goes on and you start to think that maybe you're crazy, that maybe you made it up. And I'm here to tell you that that's normal. That's a normal uh, thought process. And I'm also here to tell you that it did happen. And you have to accept and acknowledge that it happened. And the reason why is because once you start tippy-toeing into the world, whether it's relationships, um, romantic, or friendships, you're going to start getting triggered. And if you don't acknowledge and accept the fact that your last relationship was as bad as it actually was, the triggers that are happening, you're not going to recognize them as being triggers, and you could potentially... Uh, miss, categorize, or what word am I looking for? Not really gauge relationships as well as you should be because you, basically there's red flags everywhere. You're going to feel as if there's red flags everywhere and you're scared of everyone all the time. You think everyone's out to get you. It takes a second and you have to, the, the whole acceptance makes it that much easier to realize that triggers are going to happen. Does that make sense? So once you accept it and acknowledge the fact that, you know, you have to heal, you have to take the time, um, it's not your fault, it's their fault, you can then kind of put that in a bottle and say, okay, this happened to me. Now, because this actually truly did happen to me, there's going to be side effects to this happening. You don't want to deny it, okay? So the next thing you know, you you go out into the world and everything's good, you know, good. You're going to start making relationships, friendships, romantic ships, and you're going to have to learn how to set your boundaries. I sucked at that. Um, I was, 
I was so extreme because I was so scared, like more not mortified isn't even the right word because that's embarrassment. I was petrified. I was absolutely petrified of being hurt again to the point of anxiety and nerves and stress and shaking and overthinking and double thinking and not trusting myself. And because of this, my boundary setting was rude it was non-emotional. It was matter of fact, not calm and not empathetic at all. It was the exact opposite of who I am as a person. But this is because it's very uncomfortable. If you are a true empath, it's very uncomfortable to set boundaries, especially if you're not used to it. If you're not used to being able to have a voice, speak your mind, and have like rules around what is expected in and around your world, if you've never done that before, you're going to come across weird, either too weak or too strong. And I didn't want to come across too weak. I didn't want to come across as like, ooh, maybe you can, maybe you can't. I don't know why don't you play with it and see if you can push me over. I wanted to set a line in the sand and I didn't want to back up and then set another line and then back up and set another line and make it so that my boundaries were weaker and weaker and weaker. I wanted to set a definitive line in the sand, stand at my line, And make sure that nobody crossed it. And that was me acting almost as if like somebody from the Navy or the Army or, (laughs) you know, very matter of fact with it. And it didn't come across loving. Uh, Nobody necessarily gave me a hard time about it until the man that I'm with now, who I've been with now a few years. And luckily, he was very patient and he was very loving and very good at communicating. And it took us a while together for us to really realize that uh, the reason that I was being so heartless, that was one of the words he used to use, you're being so heartless, is because I didn't know how to do it. And I had to figure that out. And What's even crazier is I didn't know that I was even setting boundaries to know that I was setting boundaries harshly. I just knew that like I had rules and I was not going to break my rules and, you know, nobody was going to make me do anything, say anything, act any way unless it's exactly how I wanted to do it. And it wasn't until, again, more research, more reading, more education in this realm where I realized, oh, these are boundaries that I'm setting and I suck at setting them. I absolutely suck at setting them. So I had to learn. I had to learn to set boundaries, but I had to learn how to do it lovingly and learn how to do it with empathy, which is where I am naturally. But the a uh, trauma that came along with everything that I endured pretty much during my entire life of not having a voice, not being able to speak, not being able to t- tell people how I actually feel. Um, it took a while. It took a long while for me to actually uh, get over that and learn how to do it correctly. Uh, The next one is prepare for complex emotions, okay? Now, this is during the breakup, and this is after the breakup. So, obviously, just think of just your normal breakup. (laughs) When a normal person breaks up, there's a ton of emotion. I mean, there's crying, there's shock, there's anger, sadness, frustration. Now, you add the fact that there's a narcissist involved in this breakup, the anxiety and everything that goes along with it just goes through the roof. You can add fear. You can add paranoia. You can add shame. Um, So much emotion is involved when breaking up with a narcissist. 
10 times more than any other healthy or normal, obviously if you're breaking up, it's not healthy, but any other just normal relationship that's not involved with a narcissist, it's 100 times more difficult than that. So if you're in a relationship and you are looking to jump off into being on your own and leaving that, be mentally and emotionally prepared. Don't let that scare you though. Okay. Don't let the words that I just said scare you. The reason why is because you've already dealt with all of it. Everything that he is going to or she is going to throw at you is everything you have already dealt with. The difference is the extra, the extra that's coming along with it. It's, it's a elevated a little bit more. And then there's also the fear that he's, they are putting into you as far as you not being able to make it on your own. So all of the uh, tactics that a narcissist uses during the relationship is all the same tactics they're going to use at the end of the relationship. So you can handle that. Absolutely 100% you can handle that. But they're also going to put the fear in you. And that's where it gets tricky because they're going to tell you that you cannot make it on your own. They're going to tell you that no one will ever love you the way that they love you. They will tell you that you'll never find love. They'll even um, knock you on your looks, on how you look, on how you feel, on how you sound, on your education, um, basically labeling you as unlovable, one, and then also not successful. So the fact that, you know, my ex told me that I would end up, he's like, you're going to end up living in a cardboard box within a few months and you're going to come crawling back to me. And that's devastating. That is absolutely devastating to hear out of anyone's mouth and especially out of someone's mouth that you gave so much time to and that you tried so hard and that you have been going through this whole thing for so long and you know that it's horrible and you know that it's bad and you know that it's uh, not healthy. And then on top of that, they're almost making you feel crazy because they're like, you're never going to find somebody who loves me this much, who loves you this much. And you're like, what are you talking about? You don't even love me. You don't even appreciate me. Nothing you do is love. So it's the added just mumbo jumbo and ridiculousness kind of like balled together in a snowball, just whacking you one after the other. And be prepared for that, but also know a thousand percent, without a doubt, you are capable. You are absolutely capable of getting through that. And I know that because you're already in the relationship. Okay, you've already dealt with all of the stuff that there, there's nothing new. If you notice, if you've been with one for long enough, they have the same argument. It's the same argument. It's the same cycle over and over again, just like a different thing. Like mine got to the point where I, towards the end, mine was 13 years long, 15 if you add how long I worked with him. At the end, I, I basically, I had so much confidence at the end, I don't necessarily recommend this, but I was like, don't you have any other, like, ammunition? Is there nothing else that you can throw at me? You're literally throwing at me the same stuff over and over and over again. Like, got it. I'm dumb. Got it. I'm uneducated. Got it. I don't have a college education. Got it. I'm an idiot. Got it. I'm worth nothing. Got it. I'm unorganized. Got it. Like, I already know this. I already know all of these things. Why are you even with me? What is the point of all of this? Do you have anything new? So they're just going to, they're throwing, they're, it's the same thing. They're not, they're smart, but they're not that smart. They're not going to come up with like some magical thing at the very end uh, to, to like grasp you back in. It's going to be the same stuff. It's just going to be highlighted a little bit more. They're going to use the fear tactics times a hundred. And of course, the smear campaign, you know, you have to be ready for that, depending on family, friends, or what kind of acquaintances you had. With me, we had nobody. 
Um, I was completely isolated. The only individuals we had was the people that we work with. That's all we hung out with. So as far as a smear campaign, it wasn't like anybody that I held close to me or that I loved, you know, obviously his parents. But even that, I never really got really close to his parents because I knew even though it lasted forever, I knew I was not going to be with him long term. It just took a really long time for me to actually break the cycle. But deep down, I purposely did not create a good, healthy relationship with his parents because I didn't want that to be an, I knew that. I didn't want that to be like an extra hold. You know how when you get in a relationship with people, it's like you stay with them because you also have a really good relationship with their brother or their sister or their mom and you don't want to like disappoint them or frustrate them or mess up the little cycle of friendships you have. I knew that this was not a thing. So I purposely did not really grow attached to his family. But there will be smear campaigns. So if you do, if you are friends with his sister or his mother, or, you know, um, they will more than likely smear your name all over the place. But that happens a lot in other relationships also, not just with narcissists. That's just normal. And that is a lot of times why people stay in unhealthy relationships or stay in marriages that they're not fully committed to or fully excited about is, you know, the relationships around the relationship. They don't want to lose their friends. They don't want to lose the family or the extended family. And so they stay for that. It's not even any longer about your spouse. It's now become about the community around your relationship that you're um, stuck in. So, and I'm sure you guys can relate to that. Uh, the next thing is reclaim your identity. So figure out who you are. Figure out who you are. I'm sure there was a lot of things that were said. Narcissists a lot of times use your looks against you. Um, I didn't really let that get to me too much. Uh, and I think the reason why is because even though he did say some pretty rude, nasty things to me, a handful of times throughout a relationship, he would often say, you know, one of the backhanded compliments that he would give me was, you know, uh, if you weren't so pretty, I would, I wouldn't date you because uh, you're stupid or whatever it was. Like he would kind of like tell me that I was pretty along with telling me that I was dumb at the same time. And he knew that that hit me harder because I'm very... Uh, conscious of my intellect. So he knew that hitting my intellect actually hurt me more than hitting my physical attributes. So I didn't really uh, have that issue, but that is an issue. Um, I talk to females all the time that I am mentoring and coaching, and one of the biggest issues they have is low self-esteem. They've either, either gained a bunch of weight or lost a bunch of weight because they can't eat. And when they leave the relationship, the first thing they want to do is start going to the gym, um, dye their hair, cut their hair, fix their looks, whatever it is. And I'm not here to tell you one way or the other. I'm not here to tell you one way is better than the other. What I am going to tell you is be true to yourself. Be true to yourself and reclaim your identity as you want it, okay? So if your spouse, you know, I know mine was really weird on clothing or my heels. I was not allowed to wear heels because he was like one or two inches shorter than me, which is crazy. Uh, but I wasn't, every time I would wear heels, he'd make some sort of side comment about me looking inappropriate and other choice words. And uh, so when I got out of that, one of the first things I did was freaking went out and bought myself some heels. Um, and, you know, clothing. Clothing's too tight. Clothing's too baggy. Clothing's too uh, revealing, too short. Get back to who you are, your style. Uh, a lot of times that's lost because you're trying to morph or transform into their perfect ideal. And they make it very clear on what you're supposed to look like or not supposed to look like. So before you just jump, 
you know, off, off the boat and start swimming towards a uh, physical identity, take some time. I'm going to ask you to take some time and really uh, figure out what it is you you want. And if I if it's identical to what you have become, then freaking stay that. You know, I did not touch my hair. I did not touch the color of my hair. I did not touch the complexion of my skin. I really didn't even touch my clothes. The only thing I changed was my shoes. Even though he had a ton of stuff to say every once in a while, um, I like the way that I dress. I like the way that I look. And um, I pretty much kept it kept it the same. And uh, I know that there are women that do feel as if they need to make a drastic change. And I fully support you. And I fully support, you know, the the clients that I work with when they want to all of a sudden go dye their hair blonde or, or dark or chop it, um, get start getting their nails done or their toes done or whatever it is, because um, they weren't allowed to do that when their past relationship. There's even times when it's the opposite, you know, guys that insist that they get their nails done. And the first thing they do is take their nails off and go grow natural because they hated fake nails. So there's all different levels, all different realms. Just be true to to what you actually want. And if you don't want to put any time or effort into that right now, you just are you. And then six months later, you decide to buzz all your hair off and dye your, your scalp green or something uh, and get full arm tattoos because that's your uh, your identity that you're you're seeking then that's fine too you know uh, it takes a second it takes a second to really morph you've been constrained you've been almost imprisoned and your mind has been conditioned to think a certain way and do things a certain way and act a certain way and be a certain way. And it's going to take some time for you to get out into the world and see in years have gone by too. For some of you, you know, for me a decade, and I've, some of my clients have been in their relationship for almost 30 years and they don't even know they don't even know what's out there or what's available to them. And sometimes I even offer, you know, uh, Pinterest, you know, Google images and Google what um, what you think you like and, you know, base your inspiration on your new identity off of that and um, all kinds of ways. So that's my advice for that. And the next one is uh, practice self-compassion. Be patient with yourself. It's going to take a second. There's going to be times when you miss them. There's going to be times when you are sad. Uh, for a very long time when I left, I would go to sleep. And it still even happens now sometimes. But I would go to sleep thinking about an old bed an old house that we used to live in, you know, my ex and I, and I would picture the house and picture the bed and picture my nightstand. And, and I still don't know the logic behind it. I don't know why I did that, but for some reason I felt, felt comfort. And the only thing that I could think of is I felt or feel comfortable remembering that as I fall asleep because I know that I'm free. And I don't know if that is what that is, but for some reason, for a very long time after I left, I really felt comfortable falling asleep in an old bed. And it had nothing to do with romance. It had nothing to do with love. It had nothing to do with kissing or sex or romance or anything. Zero. It was literally just my side of the bed. And, and now that I think about it, maybe it's just I spent so much. There was so much anxiety within me every single night. Every single night that... Maybe I want to relive the moments in a peaceful state because I didn't have that peace. Because I always choose a different setting. It's very strange. But again, 
it doesn't have to mean anything. It does. You don't have to dig in deep and and figure it out, or you know, explain it a thousand times, or dwell in the problem of what it is or what it could be. Just be patient and practice compassion with however your mind and your body needs to deal with what you went through. It's very traumatic when you give so much energy to somebody and get nothing in return. It's traumatic. It really is. And you don't have to blame yourself. You don't have to, after you leave, you don't have to blame yourself for your feelings of how frustrated you are, or how infuriating it is. It's fine. You are allowed to have the feelings that you are feeling while you are feeling them. What I'm going to ask of you is not to sit in the negative feelings for too long. Sit in them, yes. But don't wrap yourself Don't wrap yourself in them. Don't dwell in them. Don't overthink them. I want you to get up and get out. I want you to read books on confidence, read books on self-worth. Visit me here on YouTube for inspiration and motivation. My TikTok is full of positive affirmations and positive things. You have to wrap yourself around positivity versus dwelling in what it was. Okay? You don't want to dwell in the problem for too long. Um, The next thing is understand that your feelings may linger, which is what I was just talking about. It takes a second. So that goes right along with feeling compassion and being compassionate with yourself and how you feel. Um, It's going to be difficult Uh, Anytime you stop loving somebody, anytime you are around somebody 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and then you just go cold, it doesn't matter who it is. It's going to be sad. It's going to be sad and it's going to linger for a second. It takes time for your mind and your body to really truly heal from whatever that was. So I'm going to insist that you take care of yourself. Make sure you're getting enough sleep. You have to sleep. If you feel like you're having insomnia, which I hear a lot from my clients, because your mind is just going a thousand miles an hour, you need to start exercising. You have to. Stop drinking caffeine. Keep the caffeine, if you have to drink it, in the morning only. Stop drinking caffeine after like 11 noon, I'm telling you. And exercise. If you are not sleeping, you need to get an exercise regime in place ASAP today. No excuses. You need to wear yourself out. You should be exercising anyways. You already know that. But if you are not getting restful sleep, you need to exercise. Um, Make sure you're relaxing. Make sure you get a hobby activities, something to keep you focused, something to excite you, something to work to look forward to, something else to focus on. All right? And stay away from the at the addictive things. I don't want you sitting around watching Netflix drinking wine all night. Find something productive to do that is going to build you up. Build you up. Don't dwell and, and drink yourself to death. Stay away from that stuff. Connect with loved ones. Um, eat balanced meals. And exercise, which I already said. If you need to talk to somebody, if you need to talk to somebody, I am a mentor. I am a coach strictly for narcissism. I do have other things that I... That I um, uh, do mentorships for under Human Better 365, but my actual niche that I am absolutely passionate about is narcissism. Um, meet me on Facebook Lives, DM me, ask for a mentorship. Um, I have an online course coming up soon. Instagram, Facebook, reach out to me, ask questions, inquire. I went through, oh, 
so much sexual abuse, financial abuse, mental, emotional abuse. The only thing that I didn't deal with was physical. Um, there was one incident very early on in our relationship and he looked me dead in the eye and he said, if you want to be in a relationship that hits, you let me know because I will hit you back. And after that, that was it. We never talked about it. Never was brought up again. Um, but the worst of the worst when it comes to that, I was completely in involved in his life. I had no outside contact. I lived with any sort of advice on how to do that. Come to me. Okay. Um, Talk to others who are willing to give you compassion, who are going to validate your pain and experience. There are going to be people that do not understand. You're going to explain a story and they're not going to understand the story because it is narcissism and they don't understand the little tiny pecking that happens all day, every day. It is almost impossible for somebody to understand what it's like to be in a narcissistic relationship unless they have been in a narcissistic relationship. If they have never been in one or if they are in denial of being in one, they will not understand it. Don't even waste your breath. Join Facebook groups. Join meetups. Talk to me here. Talk to people who have been through it, who understand it, and who are compassionate about it. Um, get professional support. There's therapists. So many, so many individuals who deal with narcissism and can help you with the issues that you are dealing with. So that is all that I have for you today on uh, recovering from narcissistic abuse and kind of the issues that you're going to go through during that. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. You can always uh, direct message me. You can always hit me up here on my Facebook Lives, YouTube, or here on my podcast. It was so awesome talking to you guys, and I hope to talk to you again real soon.